do you get if you double zero? Well, let's see. There's zero. Double it with another zero. And you get eight. <laughs> it's no wonder, is it, that I gave up teaching maths after a year to teach economics and business studies and some RE as well in secondary schools. And I did that for over 20 years before I joined counties over 10 years ago. And since I've joined counties, guess what? I've done a load of teaching in schools, going into primary and secondary schools, delivering RE lessons as a Christian visitor. Anyway, good morning everyone, and welcome to Life Connect. To all you teachers, yes, you, before you turn off, that's you. You're a teacher, whether you like it or not, whether you realise it or not. It's not just Bible teachers and counties evangelists who are teachers. It's not just people employed to teach in schools who are teachers. Not even just those who've been homeschooling their kids and helping them uh, during lockdown. Actually, whether or not we like it, we are all teachers. And you're a teacher in the sense that people see what you do and hear what you say and are potentially influenced by you for better or for worse. And actually, the younger they are, the more, and the better they know you as well for that matter, the more likely they are to be influenced by you. You know, people probably learn more from what we do than from what we say. I'm ashamed to say this was brought home to me when our son Daniel was a toddler. We had ants using our kitchen as a highway. And despite this sort of stuff, they still used it as a public highway. And one morning I was there in the kitchen, Daniel was sitting at the table eating his breakfast and I was so annoyed and frustrated, I started stamping on the floor and shouting, die! Well, Daniel pricked his ears up, looked at me, got up from the table and started stamping randomly on the floor going, die, die, die! I was ashamed and embarrassed and shocked. Shows what an influence we can be, doesn't it? And of course, school teachers are significant in the lives of children. They can have such a profound influence. So what can we learn from school teachers about discipling the next generation, the new generation, but preferably with God's heart? Psalm 145 verse 4 says, One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. I've got a fantastic painting here. That was done by a 10 year old, our daughter Lorna when she was 10. Artistic talent. She got it from her mum, my wife Lindsay. She certainly didn't get it from me. I reckon if I had any artistic talent, it was crushed by the first art teacher I had in secondary school. You see, in our first lesson, we were all told Next lesson, you've got to come with an old shirt from home to put over your school uniform, over your school shirt, so that if you get any splashes of paint on that shirt, it won't matter, it won't get on your uniform. So my parents very kindly supplied me with an old shirt of my dad's. But my dad had absolutely no taste in shirts whatsoever. And this shirt was bright pink. In the days when Pink was just not cool. You did not wear pink shirts as a bloke or as a boy. And from that day on, that teacher called me Pinky. And I believe that crushed the artistic spirit of me, scarred me for life. But seriously, I'm sure you know adults who have been scarred, sadly, by teachers or other adults calling them stupid or thick and who've believed that and been affected by it for the rest of their lives sometimes. And I hope we all know adults, or better still are those adults, who flourished in some way because a teacher or other adults saw potential and gave us positive words of praise and encouragement. I've never forgotten the acronym and phrase from my teacher training, which you saw at the start. 
CBG. And it stands for Catch Them Being Good. And this was part of a behavioural approach to teaching. So the idea is you spot, you keep your eyes open for pupils doing or saying something good and you praise them for it. Even though sometimes they may drive you nuts because that particular pupil is very difficult to try. But no, catch them being good. How do we see children and young people, and adults for that matter, in our sphere of influence? I'm sure we don't see them as stupid or thick and wouldn't dream of using those words uh, to them or about them. But do we see them as God sees them, made in his image? Admittedly, that's broken by sin, but as those who potentially can be made new creations in Christ. Do we try and catch them being good? Do we try and give them praise and encouragement? You know, I'm indebted to some who were a generation or two older than me as I was growing up, as I was a, a teenager and, and young adult, and who really encouraged me in my Christian walk. People like the late Bob and Belle Patterson from Walker on Tyneside. Dorothy Butler from Darleston in the West Midlands. And Peter Downs, latterly of Swanage, down on the south coast. They must have seen what a cocky... Uh, and, and immature young man I was and yet they took the time and trouble to encourage me in every way they could. Teachers you know often comment that it's amazing how many difficult children and young people aren't far worse when you know what sort of background they've got, the abuse they've maybe suffered. Doesn't mean they let them behave badly in school but it means their discipline is tempered by compassion. So do we demonstrate the compassion of Christ in our attitude towards young people and others? Maybe by even sometimes compassionately challenging certain behaviours as the Lord leads. But you know, our teachers and other staff in schools make a concerted effort to work together to help and develop children. That task, of course, has been made much harder because of lockdown and the way they've got to teach at present and arrange things to minimise the risk of spreading coronavirus in schools. You've probably heard the old African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. And that means that it takes an entire community who've got to interact with children for those children to grow in a safe and healthy environment. But I guess in our individualistic and fragmented society, that's largely been lost sight of, hasn't it? But you know, as church, we're community, we're family, and we care deeply about the next generation that God's entrusted us with. And we've all got a part to play in helping and developing them, not just children's and youth workers, not just even their parents. The rest of us can make such a difference with our attitude and our words of encouragement and our conduct. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 to 7, the Israelites were told, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. There are so many godless influences on the next generation. Can I challenge you and say, who are you influencing and teaching in a godly way in your family, in your community? in your church. We want to see the next generation being a godly generation with godly leaders. Let's pray. Father, help us to share your heart for this new generation, that we would be good examples to them in word and deed, 
and that they would grow up to be a godly generation for the glory of our Lord Jesus. In his name. Amen. Well, thanks very much for listening and may God bless you.